Welcome to the Kielder Observatory podcast. I'm Ian Brannan, and once again, we're back to update you with some of the things that have been happening at Kielder Observatory, and also to point you in the direction of some events in the night sky over the coming weeks as we head into August 2021. I'm joined in this episode by Director of Astronomy at Kielder Observatory, Dan Pai, and Science Communicator, Naz Jahan Shahi. Our special guest in this episode, though, is David Wilkinson. Or should I say the Reverend Professor David Wilkinson, to give him his full title. He's just happy with David. (laughs) He'll be pleased to hear. Now, David is the principal of St John's College in Durham. He's an astrophysicist, of course an academic, but also a British Methodist minister and theologian. So, with those particular backgrounds in mind... How does his opinion of the birth of the universe differ from that of the textbooks of religion versus the textbooks of science? I think the first chapter of Genesis is not meant to be read as a scientific textbook. It's actually, for me, it's a hymn or a song of worship. And therefore, to simply put it beside the scientific account, it's a false contrast. It's a fascinating chat with David Wilkinson about life, the universe and and everything else. And that's on the way very soon. First of all, though, let's find out what's been happening at Kielder Observatory over the past month and indeed what will be happening over the coming weeks. And as well, some things to look out for in the night sky, wherever you are, either in the northeast of England or anywhere else for that matter. And let's speak with Director of Astronomy, Dan Pai. And um, Dan, things still moving nicely at the observatory because whilst restrictions have eased further in in the last few weeks or so, you're keeping things the same for the time being numbers-wise in the sessions at Kielder Observatory. But um, it must have been great to, to enjoy a period of some fairly settled weather over the last few weeks with some fairly clear skies over that time as well. Yeah, there has been. It's been really nice. Um, not much has changed, like you say. We've stayed fairly fairly the same. Uh, our operations have stayed the same. The only thing that has changed over the last uh, month or so is we've had some people off with the pandemic that's been going on. Um, so we've had some staffing shortages that we've had to contend with. But aside from that, it's all been absolutely fine. Yeah, it's been good. Um, it's been busy. Uh, of course, we've been selling out. Uh, in fact, we're sold out much of the way through to December now. Um, there's certainly events which are not available until next year. Things like Aurora and late night events are all sold out. Um, and yeah, it's been lovely and clear. We've got to see the, in fact, actually a couple of weeks ago, we got to see just the first glimmer of the Milky Way starting to creep back through again um, as, as we get into the darker nights as well. So that, that, that's been amazing. I love, I love this time of year when we start to see the Milky Way coming back uh, to view in the night sky. That's one of my favourite things to see. We've had some really good moons and stuff as well. Um, good shots of the moon, good shots of, uh, of, of the planets, although they are quite low on the horizon at this time of year. Um, we've, we've done some really good uh, observing at the observatory. And I know that you've been saying really throughout the course of the year and that, you know, this time of year, August, September, is, is really good. Uh, you get the best of both worlds, really. It's not freezing cold, mm. um, but you've got a nice balance of darkness and, and also things to see in the night sky as well, like the um, like the Milky Way coming back, as you mentioned, which always makes such a, a great photo, if, if, if nothing else, for, for the astrophotographers among us. Yeah, it does. Absolutely. Yeah, it's an amazing thing to photograph. And at this time of year, it's perfectly positioned. So it lands right down the middle of our sky. So as we start to creep into the end of August, the Milky Way is running from horizon to horizon right across the top of our heads for much of the night. And it just makes such a great photograph to capture just that 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 central part or, or as close to the central part as we can get anyway, where we see the mass of all of the stars that are in that central area of the disk of light that we're inside of um to see that is 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 amazing but to photograph it is just something else yeah fantastic stuff and there's other things to look out for in the night sky this month um coming up um as as we sort of mentioned it's sort of free time of year really with light nights and all that kind of stuff don't really play into the hands of of many amateur astronomers unless you want to stay up really late into into the night and then even then it starts getting light again but we've got some planetary action that people can look out for and um fairly early in the in the scheme of things as well when when the sun's going down, um, this, some of the planets are coming up. 
Yeah, that's it. Yeah, we've got um, a great time of year to do some planet observing because the bigger and brighter planets are available at this time of year. Saturn and Jupiter uh, are, are at their highest position of the year. Um, Jupiter, in fact, is at opposition later in the month, um, which means that it's completely opposite the sun uh, from our perspective. Um, and we've also got some 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 great shots of, of Venus and Mercury as well. And Mercury is an interesting one because we don't get to see, well, I say we don't get to see Mercury that often, but it's because it's so close to the sun. Um, but I think it's just quite a hard planet to spot. So after sunset, a little bit later in the month, you'll be able to spot um, Mercury just quite low down on the horizon. So you'd need to get quite a good view of the horizon to really maximise your potential of being able to see um, Mercury. Um, Venus as well is a nice planet. I, I like to look at Venus and the reason why I like to look at Venus is because it's, it's like the moon because it's an inferior planet. It has phases associated with it because of course we can only see planets because they're being illuminated by the sun and because it's inwards towards the sun and from our perspective in the solar system it's bouncing light back towards the sun and so as it comes around closer to us it starts to create this little crescent and then as it moves out the other way it goes from crescent to full status as it gets around the other side of the sun at the moment it's like a little rugby ball um, and it's because it's such a, a, a reflective atmosphere that Venus has as well. It's a really, really dense atmosphere that Venus has and very, very reflective of light. So you see this beautiful, bright light uh, in the night sky, which is, is Venus across usually to the west at this time of year. Your monthly feature, Pie in the Sky. <laughs> um, if you were going to be stretching any an amateur astronomers um, just a little bit to, to look for something that maybe is beyond the obvious, beyond the planets, beyond the moon and all the things that we know. Where, where at this time of year should we be looking for this month, do you think, for, for somebody to, to see something different? Yeah, all right. That's a, that's a good one. OK, so as the night gets a little bit later, um, there's an object which you can just about make out with a really nice telescope. You, you will need a telescope for this one. Unfortunately, not a pair of binoculars will be able to capture this one. Probably anything above an 8-inch telescope with a, a reasonable um, degree of, of magnification on there, a good eyepiece, maybe something like a 32 mil plus would get you a good view of this object. Um, it is very small. Uh, it is a planetary nebula called the Blue Snowball Nebula and it sits in the constellation of Andromeda. So you'll have to wait a little bit later in the night as Andromeda starts to rise that little bit higher. You'll need a moonless night but what we're looking at is something 1800 light years away that's a remnant of a star, possibly similar to our sun. Um, it's, it's an incredible uh, little tiny fuzzy uh, blue uh, ring of, 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 of stuff which is, of course, the, the remnants of a star which has died previously in the existence of our, of our galaxy. All of the outer layers of this star have started to emanate away and create this beautiful diffuse object around a little tiny white dwarf in the centre. So that's, that's the challenge. See if you can see that one. And we're also approaching the time of year where we've got more um, great meteor showers to look forward to as well, which are always so spectacular and, and exciting to look out for on a nice clear night. The the Perseids meteor shower, which is a big um, a big event in the uh, in the astro astronomy calendar, really, isn't it? There's there's um, the potential for some quite spectacular scenes. Yeah, it is. It's one of the most active uh, events of the year in terms of meteor showers. It's one of my favourite as well. Of course, I love a meteor shower. Who doesn't? love a meteor shower they're always very dramatic uh, and what's always worth just remembering when we see these meteors is that they're just tiny little bits of dirt really no bigger than maybe a, a piece of salt or a grain of sand uh, as a result of us transiting through the tail end of a comet um, and and it's incredible stuff to see because we, we see an increased amount of this activity around this time of year because we're transiting through the tail end of that comet we'll get meteors throughout the rest of the year because of course we get the sporadic bits of dust hitting us every year. In fact, actually, we get about 4 million meteors every single day globally, whereas this particular shower gives us, from any viewer's point of view, about 150 per hour. So that's quite a quite an active shower that we're able to see. It's as moving through the tail end of a comet called Swift-Tuttle, um, which is, uh, which is an, an awesome little comet orbiting around the sun. And um, this year, the, the reason why it's so good this year is because we don't have a moon in the sky. It's, a, it's just after the new moon in August on the 13th. 
12th to the 13th is the uh, is the peak. Um, so the night of the 12th, from midnight as we start to move into the 13th, get outside and pull up a chair and just look at the night sky and just watch for all of these meteors that we should hopefully be able to see. You want to try and get yourself into a dark sky area. Um, try and protect yourself from any horizontal light if you can't get to a dark sky area, just to increase your opportunity of being able to see these things with the naked eye above our heads. Let's talk now about our special guest in this episode because um, a very interesting guy the reverend professor david wilkinson who is the principal of st john's college in durham and um very interesting background but also an interesting position in life in that he's a, a trained methodist minister but also um an astrophysicist who has uh, a fantastic understanding of life, the universe, and and everything, quite literally. And sometimes those those beliefs, though, traditionally don't necessarily marry up with each other, do they? They don't, and and it's funny that they don't actually. And it always perplexes me why they don't, because it's only really been the past four hundred years that we've had this divergence. I remember there was a particular chap in the sixteen, sorry, in the fifteen hundreds, sixteenth century. It was a guy called Giordano Bruno, a very famous, well known uh, theologian of the time, or philosopher as you might call him. And he 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 came up with some really incredible theories that he was trying to convince people. One of which was that all of the stars in the night sky are sun. This was a, a real pioneer of that concept that the night sky is filled with suns that are really far away with planets going around them. And he was persecuted for that. He came to the UK and tried to spread that that knowledge here in the UK, tried to get people to buy into it, and then went back to his home, Italy, where he was arrested. And the time that he spent in jail, he was questioned heavily as to well, why are you telling people this? It's 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 testing our our belief. And um, yet, when it came to his trial, he was questioned, well, do you refute the, the Immaculate Conception? Do you uh, refute uh, uh, Mary and all of this stuff? And, and the stuff that I don't really know what I'm talking about, because obviously it's theology, I don't do that. But um, he was asked all of these questions about religious belief. And he said, no, I believe in that. I believe in the Immaculate Conception. I believe in God. I'm just saying that all of these planet, all of these objects are suns like ours, and they have planets going around them. And anyway... The church at that time didn't really like that kind of theory, and so they set fire to him um, as a result of of that theory. Um, but it's quite interesting to just watch the developments of of the church's acceptance of various different theories as as eras progress. Because of course, ten years later, Galileo spouting his mouth about how the sun has a surface and it's spinning round, and Jupiter has planet has little stars of its own going around it. And they didn't like that, but they didn't set fire to him. Instead, of course, they just put him under house arrest. But it's just interesting to see the relationship between religion and, and science do this interesting tango with each other as the years progress and as different information becomes available and essentially more physical proof becomes available that they then have to deal with. The the, the philosophical side of things, they can, they can deal with that by silencing people, but the physical aspects are more difficult to deal with, it seems. So it's really interesting to have someone like David to get that, that real insight from his point of view. Well, luckily, he's uh, not been set fire to so far, and hopefully that will continue to be the case through the course of our chat with him <laughs> today. Um, the Reverend <laughs> Professor David Wilkinson is uh, on the way in a moment here on the Kielder Observatory podcast. You're listening to the Kielder Observatory podcast. I'm Ian Brannan. Joining me from Kielder Observatory is uh, Director of Astronomy Dan Pai and Science Communicator Naz Jahan Shahi. Our special guest in this episode is the Reverend Professor David Wilkinson. Now, he's a British Methodist minister, a theologian, an astrophysicist and an academic and is currently the principal of St John's College in Durham and professor of the Department of Theology and Religion at Durham University. So how does his knowledge and his beliefs on how the universe perhaps began compare with that of being a Methodist minister? Well, we're going to answer those questions very soon. But first of all, my great pleasure to welcome David. Uh, welcome to the Kielder Observatory podcast. Where did your interest in space first begin, though, David? Well, take us right back to the beginning. Whereabouts are you from and where did that uh, fascination with the universe start? 
I grew up in the Northeast, and I was six years old when on a grainy television screen, black and white, I saw the uh, the moon landing and Neil, Neil Armstrong make in that small step and I suppose that was an iconic image for me and fascinated me about space. Um, I've always been into science fiction, both literature, movies and television, uh, but I, I was never the child who took science that seriously at school. But I did find myself doing physics at Durham University and the first two courses in those days that you did as a student were general relativity and quantum theory. Now that was quite a difference to uh, the endless rolling of wooden trolleys down benches at school, which I thought all physics was about. And it suddenly began to engage the universe in a different way. It was fun, it was confusing, it was challenging. It was far more interesting and elegant um, and I suppose it was only at undergraduate level that I started to really enjoy science um, in that kind of way. Um, I did three years of, of physics and then stayed on, did a, did a PhD with uh, the then Astronomer Royal, Sir Arnold Wolfendale, who uh, was my supervisor. And I was interested in uh, questions around star formation, the chemical evolution of galaxies, and we did a little bit of work as well on the death of the dinosaurs and whether cometary impacts were uh, the cause of not just the dinosaur extinction, but other mass extinctions. So there was a wide range of areas there. And then I, I felt a call to Christian ministry, but it wasn't about leaving science behind. I never got to the stage where I became uh, frustrated by or worried by science. Um, and as I've gone on in terms of being a Christian minister and now teaching theology back at Durham University, science has always been a very important thing for me. A, because I love it, um, I'm fascinated by it, and B, some of the theological questions uh, are really interesting. I remember at the end of my physics degree sitting down with Arnold Wolfendale and um, um, there was an offer on the table for me to go and do particle physics uh, at a, another university, which will remain nameless. But Arnold said, well, he said, I know you're a Christian, he said. And really, astrophysics is where some of the big questions you can see really clearly. Uh, and he was right about that. He was a very persuasive person, Strandall Wolfendale. And, and that's part of the reason why I did a PhD with him. And making that transition from being a, into being a minister, from being a, a scientist. Of course, the, the beliefs about the, the origins of the universe um, don't exactly run parallel with each other all the time, do they? So what was that like when, when you were yeah, um, in, 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 your, in your learnings and, and teachings uh, about that in, in the early days? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. Um, and I think two things out of that. The first is that uh, some people simply take a very literal and somewhat naive interpretation of Genesis 1 uh, and put it against the scientific account. And, you know, reading the first chapter of Genesis as a scientific textbook and saying the universe is not 13.8 billion years old, but only 6,000 years. Um, now, I, I flirted with that in my early days as a Christian. But it, it never seemed to me to be convincing in terms of, I think the first chapter of Genesis is not meant to be read as a scientific textbook. It's actually, for me, it's a hymn or a song of worship. And therefore to simply put it beside the scientific account, it's a false contrast. But I think deeper than that, more interestingly, this was a, 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 around the late eighties. And if you remember, this was when Stephen Hawking had, publ had just published A Brief History of Time. And we were, we were starting to get interested in whether there were um, quantum gravity possibilities and explanations of the origin of the universe that didn't need a first cause. And indeed, in brief history, that's what Professor Hawking was trying to do. He was trying to avoid a kind of sense of a God who reached out his, his hand, lit the blue touch paper of the Big Bang and set it off. And one or two people were using Big Bang cosmology to either try and prove God, or as Fred Hoyle and Tommy Gold and Herman Bondi had uh, kind of resisted Big Bang because of the theistic implications. 
And um, it was during that time that I think that I began to see that the Christian understanding of creator is far richer, far more interesting than just someone who lights the firework of the Big Bang and then goes off for a cup of tea not to have anything more to do with it. That actually God as the source of the physical laws, uh, the one who sustains and creates the physical laws by which the Big Bang comes about, whether it's through a quantum fluctuation in a vacuum um, or whatever, that these days doesn't worry me because that's just another part of God's creation. The really interesting question for me is where do the laws of physics themselves come from? So if, if, if uh, someone says, well, the universe came about through a quantum fluctuation in a vacuum leading to an inflationary expansion and then a normal Hubble expansion, I want to say yes to that, uh, both as a scientist and as a Christian. But I think there's a bigger question that's left, and that's a, a metaphysical question, or something that goes beyond physics, which is, where does quantum theory itself come from? Uh, where does quantum gravity, if we ever get to a consistent theory of it, come from? Now, that's, that's a question that science can raise, but it can't answer because it goes beyond science. And for me, that's where there's a really interesting conversation with philosophy, uh, with theology. And so a number of Christian folk, particularly, kind of are a bit worried about this Big Bang cosmology, either because it um, seemingly attacks the first chapter of Genesis, I don't think it does, or because it attacks this kind of uh, view of God who simply starts off the, the explosion and then goes away and retires gracefully. I don't think it attacks that either. I think actually Big Bang cosmology helps us to understand a much bigger picture of God. Um, and therefore, Christians and other faith groups need to engage with it. And with your scientist hat on, but still whilst um, representing uh, religion as well, I suppose, what, what is your hunch and your theory then to, to explain how we find ourselves here now, how the universe was born? Um, that's, I, I, I mean, to be honest... I don't know, um, but I think the, the model of the Big Bang that we have at the moment is reasonably good. Remember that science builds models which are based on evidence, and that doesn't mean that things like the Big Bang are proved. When you get to big science like this, we rarely talk about proof or disproof. You talk about, is this the best model that interprets the evidence? And um, the Big Bang model, which has been around for a number of decades now, does pretty well on interpreting the microwave background radiation, this form of radiation that pervades the whole of space. Um, the Hubble expansion of the universe, that the galaxies are expanding away from us, uh, and the amount of helium in the universe, which was one of the interests that I had. Of course, there's a number of questions that remain, which, um, we're still struggling to know what the dark matter is. Uh, we're still struggling to know um, dark energy. We're, we're still struggling to know whether the gravitational constant is constant or whether it varies. And some of the last few months have shown us some of the really interesting kind of things that we don't yet know. Uh, and of course, we still don't have that way to bring together at the very first moment of the universe quantum theory and relativity. Will string theory do it? Probably not. Will M theory do it? Possibly, probably not. So you've got to balance all of these things together. And for me, um, I think the Big Bang model is a pretty good model in broad brush strokes. Um, I think um, that we will get to a point uh, at some point uh, of understanding the very first moment of the universe. Uh, the thing that, that I'm, I'm really unsure about is whether, whether we're one universe of many universes, multi-universe. I mean, it doesn't worry me if we are. Uh, you know, I mean, God created 100 billion stars in each of 100 billion galaxies in this universe. A few more billion universes doesn't make a lot of difference. It just kind of adds a few more noughts uh, to the extravagance of God. Um, but I think that the problem of multi-universes 
is how do you know that the other universes are there? Because for the, for the scientist, you need to know whether information is passed from one universe to another. And I'm not entirely convinced that we're going to find a mechanism uh, for that to happen. So you can speculate about us being one of many, many universes. But whether we'll ever get experimental evidence for that, I'm not sure. Ian, I probably should have said at the beginning of this question or, or emphasized what I did say, which is I don't know. And uh, But I've waffled for a little bit. But I think the Big Bang is a pretty good model uh, in broad brush strokes. It's an interesting point about separate universes that's, <laughs> that makes your your mind scramble even further doesn't it um which you know that will be a, well, it is. a twist and wouldn't it, it well it is and it, it's very in at the moment it's very um um it, it lots of people talk about it uh sir martin reese um the current astronomer royal lord reese I, I should say uh, one of my great heroes in cosmology um wrote a fascinating book a number of years ago called Just Six Numbers about the anthropic balances within the universe. These, um, these very delicate balances of the law and circumstance of the universe, which makes possible life, um, or at least carbon-based life as we know it. And at the end of the book, he says, basically, you've got three options to explain this. One is that... Um, is that it just is and you don't think about it at all and he said well, really we, we humanity isn't like that um these are so extraordinary balances that make possible carbon-based life that they intrigue us there's a deeper conversation going on or he said you think god did it um and he allows that as a possibility but the third which is his preference is that we are one universe of many universes out of which the conditions are just right for us. But then of course, he's very honest to say, um, uh, and there are many theories of many universes, but all of them are mind boggling. Um, and uh, the key question is, how would we know that they're there? Um, so there could be philosophical speculation in the same way that some people would say that believing in the existence of God is. But the question is, how would you know that they're there? Now, as a, as a religious believer myself, as a Christian, one of the things that may, uh, helps me believe in God is um, the Christian claim that God has revealed something of himself into this space-time history. Christians point to that in Jesus of Nazareth. But it, it is a question about how you take philosophical speculation and get evidence of whether something is there or not, whether it be God or multi-universe. I'm oh, sorry, I muted myself then. Yeah, it, it is, <laughs> it is, it is uh, an, an, an interesting point. And do you think that um, on another subject, I suppose, that on the on the topic of life? On other planets, yeah. which is which is something that um, has been discussing, and increasingly there's hopes in sooner rather than later in the scheme of things that we will find evidence of some form of life but supposing that eventually we do find intelligent life do you think that they too will have some form of religion wherever they are okay yeah, it's a fascinating question and uh, a few years ago um i tried to explore it in a book called science religion and the search for extraterrestrial intelligence and uh, you know uh, it was quite a long book, and at the end of it, uh, the answer was, I don't know. Um, but let me just say one or two things within that context again, if I'm not entirely sure. I think it's really exciting what we're discovering about extrasolar planets. This is one of the big things in astronomy, which you guys will know uh, very well, um, that over the, course, over the course of a couple of decades, the discovery of so many extrasolar planets encourages us to believe that there are earth-like planets and the possibility of intelligent life a bit like us somewhere else in the universe and the discovery of such a thing i think would be huge it would um, raise a whole number of questions 
But interestingly enough, um, a friend of mine called Ted Peters did a survey just a few years ago where he asked a whole range of religious believers of many different faith communities, Christian, Jewish, Muslim, Buddhist. He asked the question uh, of a thousand people, all people of faith, would this affect your religious faith in any way? 70% um, said, no, it wouldn't. It would just give a sense that we're part of a bigger story. Um, he, he then asked a number of people who weren't people of religious faith, whether they felt that people who had religious faith would have a problem with the discovery of intelligent life elsewhere in the universe. And the majority of people who uh, didn't have faith said that people with faith would have a problem, uh, even though 70% didn't. So I think that the, the key to that question is the perception that people of religious faith think somehow we're special or unique, and that the discovery of intelligent life elsewhere in the universe would undercut or subvert this sense of human uniqueness. Um, it, it was very similar, incidentally, in the 19th century with Charles Darwin. Um, Darwin's theory of natural selection actually didn't uh, attack people's views of the Bible. People were quite um, happy with Darwin uh, and the Bible. What Darwin threatened, particularly in the, in the book, The Descent of Man, was this sense of the special nature of human beings, the unique nature of human beings. And I think what uh, Christians responding to Darwin found, and indeed, as I look at the possibility of extraterrestrial intelligence, is that a, a relationship can be special without it being exclusive. Now, to use a, a, a silly illustration, um, when I, when I um, have a special relationship with my son, that's a special relationship. That doesn't mean that I don't have a special relationship with my daughter. They're different relationships. They're very special and they're unique, but they're not exclusive. I don't say to my son, well, I, I can't be in relationship with you because actually uh, I'm having dinner with my daughter tonight. Um, so the God that I see within the revelation of God within Jesus Christ is, is the God um, who uh, has a wide acceptance, not just of one particular uh, group of people, a religious group of people, but a God who welcomes everyone. And so if there were other intelligent beings elsewhere in the universe, I think it would be fascinating to talk about what their religious perception is and how they see God. But I don't think it would be uh, a worry to me as a Christian. It's a, it's a fascinating topic, and maybe one day we will we will find the answer out, I, I guess. Um, I'm not, we, time, well, time will indeed yeah, tell. I mean, of course, it's, it, that's right. Although it's a difficult question, isn't it? Because um, the problem of communication over vast distances within the universe is a particular problem. So if there's a civilization in Andromeda, and they send a message uh, out into the universe saying, hello, is there only one there? Well, at the speed of light, that would take a couple of million years to reach us. If we then send a message back saying, oh, yes, we're here. Who are you? That would take another couple of million years and a little bit longer uh, to get back to them. That's not a very interesting conversation, is it? Uh, uh, but there is a real problem that there could be intelligent life but so far away from us that we'd never be able to communicate with it. Now, that raises a, a really interesting question again about um, how do you know things are there? Uh, how can you be sure or not? But uh, I mean, it's a great it's a great scientific question at the moment and a really interesting theological question. You touched a little bit there about um, the sort of conflict between science and faith and um, I know from personal experience that your perspective on it all is quite an open-minded perspective and there's there's you know um, a lot of people in religion that uh see it in a more sort of strict way um but i'm just wondering how, kind of how do you handle that conflict between science and faith and um because it, it definitely exists and i think uh people people kind of battle with it quite a lot 
Yeah, thank you, Naz. That's a really important question. And uh, and I think um, one of the things we're doing at Durham University at the moment is a big project called Equipping Christian Leaders in an Age of Science. And part of the motive for that, um, for that project was uh, the sense that often when Christian leaders encounter science, they take a step backward because they fear that there's a conflict or they're silent about it because they don't understand science. Um, and uh, neither of those is particularly helpful, either for uh, their role as Christian leaders or indeed for engaging with science as it really is. So I think the strategy is, uh, there's a number of things to say. I think the first is to uh, reread the history and to pay attention to the complexity of the history. Now, you're absolutely right that there have been times within the history where there has been conflict between science and religion. But some of those have taken on mythical proportions rather than actually um, paying attention to the complexity. So lots of people at this point would trot out Galileo and the church. Um, and uh, Galileo was put in house arrest. I don't um, want to argue that uh, the Roman Catholic Church was, was clean of all fault in this. But Galileo um, partly pointed his telescope to the sky because of his Christian faith. He was one of a number of astronomers who said, the Greeks aren't quite right in that we can't work out the universe through uh, human logic. Remember, Aristotle said the universe was built on these beautiful uh, spherical crystalline spheres because uh, spheres are the most perfect geometrical object. And Galileo said, hold on a moment, if God is free to create, then the only way that we can understand how God creates is not to try and work it out on the back of an envelope, but is to look at the universe, the importance of observation, the importance of him using his telescope to look at the universe. So part of Gal the Galileo affair is the way that religion contributed towards the development of science. So I think there's something to be said um, where we reread the history and where religious people actually have to understand that science is part of a religious heritage. It's not something that's out there. I think then secondly, I think um, sometimes the media, uh, who I think do brilliant science communication, by the way, like yourselves, uh, but there are certain sections of the media who very easily, when they're presenting science and religion, go for the conflict model. And they'll go for um, an atheistic scientist and they'll bring into the studio someone probably from America who believes in a six day creation and they'll put them together. Whereas the reality is that uh, there are many within faith communities who are scientists, technologists, engineers who uh, don't have the answer to every question, but actually uh, are authentic in their science and in their faith. And I think hearing from them is really important. And then I think the third area is actually bringing scientists and senior Christian leaders together. Now we do that in Durham. We invite bishops to come to Durham and we take them into the Institute of Cosmology. We take them into the, into the robotics lab we take them into microbiology and we introduce them to real scientists, not what they read in the media, not what they encounter in terms of, you know, the way that Christian churches sometimes present science. But we just get uh, people like Carlos Frank to talk about dark matter. Or we introduce them to some of the robots that we've got at Durham University. And I tell you what, um, a few robots encountering a few bishops is a fascinating kind of thing to watch uh, as, as they start to talk to each other, you know, AI robots talking to, to bishops. Um, but what, what happens in that is that suddenly we begin to see that both science and theology are done by real people. And once you get real people talking together, 
rather than just presenting myths or stories to each other, then you get a depth of communication. And what we often find is that uh, after our, our scientists have given talks during the day, the scientists will turn up at, at our bar in the evening uh, and talk more with the bishops and the bishops will be fascinated to talk to the scientists. So I think uh, we know ourselves, how do you break down senses of conflict or fear? It's often by real people encountering real people. And that's one of the things we're doing at Durham University at the moment. That's incredible. Uh, and it's it's really great to hear that um, you've been able to sort of bridge that gap a little bit. And you touched really briefly there on um, uh, the sort of connection between science and religion in history as well. Um, and just just elaborate on that and on, on how in, in the past they've they've worked hand in hand and it, this sense of conflict didn't always exist. That's right. I think there's a much richer history than just conflict between science and religion, and a lot of people don't realise that. I, I think it's really interesting if you look at the way that uh, science has many tributaries flowing into it. Um, the Greeks and of, of mathematics and logic, um, some of the early observational work. Uh, but then there was a, a very important Chinese contribution uh, reflecting some of the, uh, the Eastern religions. There was a very distinguished Islamic contribution into early science. And then at the time of the scientific revolution, uh, with Western Europe, in a sense, being dominated by the Judeo-Christian um, uh, worldview, we saw a birth of science happening. Now, why did, why did science as we know it grow up uh, in such a, a rapid way within Western Europe? Freeman Dyson, a great uh, astronomer and astrophysicist, um, himself not a Christian, nevertheless, uh, argued that it grew up specifically in Western Europe because of some of the f intellectual foundations that the Judeo-Christian um, narrative and framework were giving it. Because, because people believed that God had created the universe freely, you had to look at it to see what God had done. So that Kepler would say, science is thinking God's thoughts after him. Uh, so the importance of observation. Because God was a God of the whole universe uh, and over time, there should be some constancy, some faithfulness to what you see in the universe. It's not a big step from that to talk about then laws of physics. Um, because God was a universal God, you wouldn't have to think that there were certain laws in one part of the universe and different laws in another part of the universe, the universality of the laws of physics. And there's even an argument that, um, that getting your hands dirty by doing experiments was part of the earthiness of uh, the Jewish faith and the way the Christians viewed the world. Now, sometimes this is overstated. Sometimes some Christian apologists say, well, it was all due to Christianity. I don't believe that was the case. But I do believe that uh, you get this much more complex um, way that the tributaries of religion and philosophy start to form uh, what we now see as modern science. And I think this is really important, A, because history is complex. We shouldn't simply uh, present it as, as an oversimplified uh, narrative. But also, I think it gives those points of contact for people from faith communities to science. And if we're, if we're really serious, as I know you, you folk are, and, and I mean, the terrific work that you do in science communication, what you have to take into account is the background from which people are coming uh, and understand some of their fears, but also some of the ways in that you can say, hey, this is part of your heritage as well. This is uh, something that we're all interested in. You don't have to be fearful of it. Uh, you can find it liberating and joyful. Uh, um, and I think that's, that's the value of, of history um, and just paying attention to the complexity of history.
Yeah, absolutely. The um, the sort of links between science, religion, and philosophy, especially. I I, I did a bit of philosophy, uh, philosophy at college, and I found it all absolutely fascinating. And then I went back and I watched films like Contact. Um, yes, you know, yes, years after absolutely. the first time I'd I'd watched them, and realised yeah, it had a completely yeah. different meaning to me. Yeah, um, right. It'd be interesting to hear what you think about films like Contact yeah. that uh, yeah. kind of really highlight the the connection between science and faith. Yeah, I, I, I love science fiction movies. Um, I'm, a, I'm a Star Wars geek. Um, and so, um, uh, you know, I grew up uh, in, a, in a generation um, of the first trilogy of Star Wars, Star Trek. Um, Contact is a particularly interesting movie because based on the Carl Sagan novel, um, where Sagan took a whole number of really interesting scientific ideas in order to explore it. But as you say, Naz, it's really interesting the way that many of these movies uh, can't actually stop themselves from involving spirituality, philosophy, theology. Now, Gene Roddenberry, who created Star Trek, was, was very against religion. Um, and so in, in the original Star Trek series uh, and in the first movies, religion was never talked about. But as Rick Berman took over the Star Trek franchise, what you've got um, in um, particularly Deep Space Nine or, or Voyager, um, if you're a Star Trek nerd as well, um, you get little bits of religion and spirituality coming through. For George Lucas in Star Wars, the introduction of this thing called the Force was not, was not to, a, to give a new religion. But Lucas said it was it was there to help people engage with the question, is there a God? What is God like? What does God feel like? What does God sound like? Now, popular culture in movies and, and novels, I think, is really good at posing questions. It doesn't give us answers. What it does is it says, is there more to life than just the scientific account? Um, is there an interesting thing here about what it means to be human? Uh, is there something here about um, the gift of science, which has a bigger significance just uh, more than, you know, blasting people with phases? Although I do like, like the blasting people with phases. I mean, and all, of, um, all of the excitement of that. So pop culture, particularly in science fiction, well, Stephen Hawking himself, I, I don't know if you've ever read the book by Lawrence Krauss called The Physics of Star Trek. It's a great little book. It can be read in an afternoon. It goes through whether, you know, certain things are possible within the imagination of Star Trek. But Hawking wrote the foreword to yeah. The Physics of Star Trek. And Hawking said, science fiction expands the human imagination. And, and I think, you know, for me, that's, that's something that science fiction has done. And I think it expands the scientific imagination, but I think it also expands the theological imagination. And, and going back to your original question about the importance of philosophy and history, there's a very interesting research. Uh, uh, my friend and colleague, Tom McLeish, who's education secretary at the Royal Society, talked about the other day. And, and that is that if you, if you see, uh, you, we all know children who drop science early at school, and partly we want children to keep going with science. And Tom pointed out that if you teach science alongside the history of science and the philosophy of science, then actually children stay with science longer than they would if it's not if it's taught without history and philosophy i think that's really fascinating because it allows us to see some of the bigger questions that are going on just as you said that's amazing yeah i i can definitely attest to that when i was doing philosophy alongside my my physics a levels um they complemented each other really well and uh it, some of the questions that I came across in physics we were discussed in philosophy and some of the, the questions that came up in philosophy would be discussed in physics. So, yeah, the, it definitely sparks something um, inspirational. But. And, and that's really important. I think that the thing that, um, that we're perhaps not as good at uh, within, 
both secondary and higher education is giving spaces for the physicist and the philosopher to come together and talk together. Interdisciplinary conversation, I think, is really, really important. But the way that sometimes we, we set education up, and I can understand it, you know, physics teachers who are brilliant have a huge curriculum to get through uh, just to teach to the exams or the teacher assessment or whatever. Uh, once you get to university, sometimes because there's so much within your own subject area, you haven't got time um, to think about other things. Whereas actually, both at sixth form and at university, if we can find spaces, um, and podcasts are, are one of the ways um, to do this, where we actually talk across disciplines, we suddenly find there's some really interesting material here. Um, and one of the great one of the great privileges at Durham University is having colleges where people from different subject areas sit at mealtime together and can talk together from sociology to uh, biology, from um, uh, philosophy through to physics. And, and that's a really important space. I just, and, and Kielder, I think, and it's science communication, if I may say, is one of those really important spaces where science can be brought into conversation and culture, and that's very important. Well, thank you very much for spending the time with us in this episode. The um, Reverend Professor David Wilkinson from the University of Durham, Principal of St John's College, and thanks for your your insight into religion, uh, life, the universe, and everything. And um, posing actually a few more questions as well, such as parallel universes. But uh, thank you very much for joining us. It's been, it's been fascinating. Thank you, Ian. I've really enjoyed it. And as I say, thank you for all of the work that you do. I mean, Kielder is one of the kind of precious crowned the world. I've always uh, been a great fan of the work that you do. So um, every blessing for the future. Fascinating chat with the Reverend Professor David Wilkinson there from um, Durham University, Principal of St John's College, with some of his thoughts and beliefs. And there is a, a big list of books that you can get um, that he has been the author of, a few of which he's mentioned, God, The Big Bang and Stephen Hawking being one. Um, and also the uh, the book about um, science, religion and the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, another book that he mentioned there. Um, in, in our chat as well but there are a, a good number of books one, two, three, four, five, six, seven books I think he's written and many articles as well look him up online uh, the Reverend David Wilkinson my thanks then to Naz uh, for joining us and also to Dan Pye Dan you're uh, headed up the, the observatory now are you? Yeah, that's right. We've got Space Kids today, uh, followed by um, another event, which I can't remember. <laughs> it's, it's so prepared. <laughs> <laughs> It'll all come back to you. But you're going to be launching rockets, so that's going to be a good thing. Yeah, that'll be fun. Yeah. Fantastic yeah. stuff. Uh, for more information, of course, don't forget to head online, kielderobservatory.org. You can book onto any of the sessions that are available. Always keep an eye out on social media as well, because occasionally there are cancellations at short notice, what with the way of the world at the moment. Uh, things can change, and you can always maybe nip in there and, and get yourself on a session at short short notice and um, we'll be back with you next month with another episode of the Kielder Observatory podcast um, don't forget follow us on the social media channels too Facebook Twitter Instagram and um, any others uh, just search for Kielder Observatory and you'll be able to keep up to date with everything that's happening <laughs>